Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you are in the world, and welcome to today's final session of the OECD event on Digital Security for Prosperity, which is hosted by Israel. I'm Irfan Himani. I am the Deputy Director for Cybersecurity at the UK's Department for Digital, Culture, Media and Sport, and I'm responsible for cyber resilience policy for the UK's wider economy and society. I also lead the team that's looking at the government policy on managed service provider cybersecurity. Uh, in addition to this, I'm also the author of the Harvard Balfour Center's National Cyber Power Index. In this session, we will be talking about managed service providers and the security considerations around these, given their importance and the potential they bring for the growth to the digital economy. I'm joined today by two distinguished panelists uh, who will join me in, in talking about uh, the, uh, the, the issues around managed service providers. John Waters, uh, serves as the President and Chief Operating Officer at FireEye, which is a cybersecurity solutions company involved in the detection and prevention of major cyber attacks. In his previous roles, John served as the President of iSight and Chairman of the FireEye Advisory Board and Chief Strategy Officer. Udi Mokadi is the Founder, Chairman and CEO of CyberArc, which works on privileged access management. Based on his strategic vision and deep cybersecurity experience, Mokadi has established CyberArk as a global leader in identity security. Welcome to you both today. Before I turn to the panel, I wanted to introduce the topic as we see it in the UK and why we think that this is a topic of importance to be discussed during this conference. High profile cyber attacks in recent years have shown how malicious actors increasingly use vulnerabilities in third party service providers to attack victim organizations. Targeting suppliers has become an attractive attack method as attackers can circumvent cybersecurity protections of multiple and often high profile victims. MSPs or managed service providers are, a unique, are unique suppliers because they are endemic in organizations through, through supply chains across the economy. There are fewer and fewer organizations that don't have some ex exposure to MSPs. And because MSPs supply to governments and critical national infrastructure, they are essential to national security and economic resilience of arguably all OECD countries and beyond. Managed service providers bring huge benefits to customers as they provide services that organizations often don't have the skills or the resources to build on their own. It is this systemic importance of providers of managed services which brings us on this topic today. Managed service providers are both targets in and of themselves and also used to compromise other organizations. This is because managed service providers have privileged access to their customers' networks and they operate essential services, which their customers rely on for business continuity. This privileged access is what makes them especially attractive targets for malicious actors who attempt to gain unauthorized access into multiple organizations at scale. A few years ago, Operation Cloudhopper exemplified how a successful attack on a number of managed service providers can result in unprecedented access to the intellectual property and sensitive data of providers and their network of global customers. And during COVID, we have seen multiple attacks of this nature. The United, Kingdom's, the United Kingdom government's cybersecurity breaches survey this year found that just 12% of businesses have reviewed cybersecurity risks posed by their suppliers, and only 5% have done this for their wider su su supply chain, which is lower this year than in previous years. Last month, we launched a public consultation to seek views on, on the barriers and good practice for managing supplier security and are seeking input on the suitability of a proposed framework for managed service provider security. Of course, many managed service providers are international businesses working across jurisdictions, and this is a shared global challenge. In the UK, there is we believe there is value in sharing best practice and working internationally with businesses and with other countries to improve our collective cyber resilience. The OECD is a great forum to discuss this and I know it is considering some work in this area. In this session, we will explore this issue a little bit more, discuss how industry sees and approach, approaches risks associated with managed service providers, and also have a chance to discuss what avenues industry sees for, for policymakers to effectively tackle the issue. There will also be a chance for, for viewers to submit questions which we can then discuss as a panel. 
Firstly, John, I'll turn to you. Why are managed service providers such an attractive target and how are you seeing the threat landscape change in relation to managed service providers? Yeah, I think, Irvin, I mean, the, uh, I guess the, the net of it is it's an it's a economically attractive access point into a, a multitude of downstream opportunities. And what I mean simply from that is one to many. You know, so if you can be successful targeting one entity and you therefore get at trust, trusted access to many entities, it's just an efficient way to build your attack, uh, your attacker's business model. Um, but one, one thing I think might be interesting to size the problem is we're talking about uh, the you know, organization of economic cooperation and development uh, globally. I mean, there's no more impactful um, um, catalyst in the world today, including the COVID virus. I mean, that's done mammoth damage to the economy globally, mammoth damage to uh, you know society as we know it. But let's talk about what's happening with cyber in perspective. You know, if you roll back the clock to 2013, we spent around $65 billion globally on cybersecurity, lost about $300 billion globally on cybersecurity. If you add those two together, I look at that as an economic tax on the, on the global economy. It equated to about a half a percent of GDP. Roll the clock forward to last year in 2020, we spent about $130 billion on cybersecurity globally lost roughly 945 billion in cybersecurity. You add those two together, it's about one and a half percent of global GDP. Roll those same growth rates forward, and in 2030, we'll be spending roughly $300 billion on cybersecurity and lose approximately 4 trillion. The combined 4.3 trillion would equate to three and a half percent of our global GDP if that growth rate is left unchecked. So to put the economic backdrop and how important this challenge is that we all face, and the concept of working together to attack this global economic tax that we're all faced with, um, I think it's important for us to begin uh, attacking the problem differently than we have in the past. Because uh, the adversary is essentially outpacing and out innovating our security effectiveness. Uh, and that's reflected in that security gap that I just uh, identified. So. Just for perspective, as we have this discussion today, I think it's always helpful to size the problem whenever you're talking in economic terms about how you tackle a security problem. Um, it's really interesting, John, and, and I think you've, you've um, illustrated the, the stark uh, problem that we're facing and, and that this is definitely a growing problem. And in those numbers that you, that you mentioned, you also talked about the, the growing um, spending on cybersecurity by companies. Now, I suppose there's only so much that you can do from a reactive perspective to, to deal with this issue and, and, and actually um, policy solutions are needed to, to stem the tide of this. It can't just be um, uh, companies reacting. Uh, I don't know, Udi, if you, you want to come in on, on, on that point. Yeah, I, I would probably uh, add uh, to the reverse angle on the economics of the economics of uh, uh, the companies that are using MSPs. Uh, they are looking to buy and get the service at the lowest price point. The MSP is looking to uh, uh, to, to provide uh, uh, maximum profit for for itself, and so security can be lost in that uh, in that shuffle. And there's not necessarily a big incentive for the managed security provider to to invest in in their own uh, security. Hence, uh, a big part of you, compounding what John referred to as the the incentive for the attackers to go to go after this. Uh, I think we do see a difference between uh, enterprises that work with uh, with MSPs and the smaller organizations. Enterprises do seem to uh, uh, ask questions, or if they're going out for a bid on what's your security uh, posture for, for and, and ask security related questions to the MSP. But when we go down market and there's a big use of MSPs in in, in the mid market and smaller organizations, uh, they tend to more check the box. And and so if uh, the MSP is not uh, in any way, if there's no oversight on their security, they become a big part of the problem, and uh, and and uh, the the weakest point in the chain can lead to uh, to, to massive uh, uh, downstream attacks. Yeah, it's uh, you you mentioned there that there's a possibly a, a slightly more significant impact on on medium or even smaller organizations, and of course, one of the reasons why managed service providers are um, so, so popular and so useful and, and adds so much to the digital economy is that they allow smaller companies to take advantage of more advanced technologies without bringing that um, expertise in-house. Knowing that and, and, and what it is that they provide to uh, companies who are looking to, to build in the digital economy, how do you balance that with 
potentially, um, you know, increasing the costs of delivery of, 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 uh, of some of these services through increased security costs. Um, well, you know, th there's, there's really little point in, in making everything absolutely secure so that it, you know, to a point that it's too expensive or not usable. Um, so how do we get that balance between security, usability, accessibility um, for, for, for this set of uh, organizations? Yeah, I, I would say that um, we should probably look and, and part, of, part of the solution is also differentiating between the different MSPs also by, by vertical. I think an MSP that is serving the energy vertical or is serving, of course, like, like you mentioned, government uh, uh, organizations can be more expensive and, and, and invest more in security because of the criticality. Uh, and maybe an MSP that, that is serving uh, less critical parts of the, the economy uh, should should have less uh, uh, types of investments, but nevertheless, there has to be, uh, I, I think, a good balance between raising the cost, uh, but but reducing uh, reducing the risk. Like in like in every everything we do in healthcare and any regulated industry, uh, we, we find that uh, balance. And I think uh, uh, you mentioned Cloud Hopper and 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 of course Solar Winds is a is a type of an example of what supply chain can do. And and John can talk much more about that. It, it's just uh, we we can't uh, we can't allow it to be just the, the basic economic incentive, and there needs to be uh, uh, some nudge uh, or some oversight uh, to uh, uh, I would say to promote investment in security in the MSPs. There are good ones, uh, and and, uh, and and of course when we talk about MSPs, there are also managed security providers, managed security services providers. They actually differentiate on on their their security level. John, do you want to want to come in on that point on the balance between security and uh, convenience, I suppose, for um, the services being delivered by by these quite vital organizations? I'm sure. I mean, I, I think I think Udi's, Udi's really on to the right point. I mean, the customers have to balance security and profitability. And until they view as lack of security uh, a real risk to impairment, impairment of their profitability, uh, then they're not going to take it seriously. And, and that's why I put that economic backdrop what we're experiencing globally. And ransomware operators don't discriminate. I mean, they don't care whether you're a big company or a small company, you're a grocery store, you're an energy company. If you have an ability to pay, and certainly anybody that has a cyber insurance policy has an ability to pay, you're a target. So so we've seen, you know, the evolution of, of ransomware move from, you know, $1,000 type of hit everybody with a spray and pray Type of attack methodology against small companies up to tens of billion, tens of millions of dollars uh, against critical infrastructure that has downstream implications on your ability to operate as a country uh, that we've seen recently in the United States for sure. So, I mean, I think I think um, the concept of an MSP and an MSSP and, and cloud providers is to transfer risk to those people that are best suited to manage it. And if you have scale, because you're operating a larger enterprise, the downstream support of all these little customers, you would think that's a logical place to manage the security risk because all those little companies aren't going to have the money, uh, little and mid-sized companies, to actually apply the same level of security discipline to their little business as a larger company could on their behalf. Um, but there's got to be a combination of a carrot and a stick here to, in, to create the right incentives. I mean, the stick is if you're going to be providing services for someone in a regulated industry, I would think you'd have to have the same regulatory scrutiny as their service provider as the underlying customer would because they're transferring risk to you, but technically they still own it because they're the regulated industry. So some of that should actually um, transmit up to whoever the service provider is. So that's a standard they'd have to pull to. In terms of an incentive system, uh, you know, buyers, these, these small to mid-sized businesses and even larger businesses have buying power. And when they start exercising that buy, buying power based on the security discipline of their provider and they're willing to pay more for a more secure provider that they can demonstrate that they're more secure, um, you know, that's going to begin to shift the balance of power in favor of people doing the right things, which means it is, it is more profitable in the long run for a service provider to provide an excellent level of security than it is to create short-term profitability because it'll benefit the long-term growth of their business and that reputational capital will inure to their benefit over time as more and more people want to go to that provider. Um, so we have to we have to really begin to discriminate and, and uh, advantage those companies that do provide really quality security um, because there's no doubt the economics makes sense that they should be providing that 
that security layer that the small businesses can't afford to deploy on their own. I think, as I said, John, that's a really, really interesting point. I think in the long run, um, I think we all agree, and I think a lot of people watching will agree that in the long run, making the sensible security decisions um, is more profitable. Um, but I think in a lot of the conversations today and in the last few days, um, it, you know, one of the things that we're grappling with is that consumers, businesses um, that buy technologies are not prioritizing security and not building that you know long-term profitability into um, you know their business model. So I guess the question is, you know, what is it that what is it that governments can do, or what is it that businesses should be doing, or how do we how should we be seeing this the economics of this, or how, how do we change the economics of this so that um, businesses actually do factor in um, you know that that um, uh, cost into their into their business model. I know. There was a session yesterday morning on the um, Internet of Things devices, uh, of consumer connected products, which certainly in the UK, we're looking at um, you know, mandating minimum security standards because when consumers go to shops, they are not saying I'm going to buy this product because it has better security uh, features, which, you know, in the long run is better for them, their pockets, their you know, health, uh, uh, all, all range of things. H how do we actually build in to um, that the, both the, the managed service providers um, uh, business model, but also companies buying these products, um, this uh, cost of security and the benefits of good security. Yeah, so I think, I think uh, we, we both mentioned that regulated industries are a little bit easier. So we, 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 we the, the governments can, can make sure that, uh, that the MSP in a specific vertical has to comply uh, with the same standards that we we expect the, the the organization, it gets harder in the less regulated. And I think there's a combination of of what countries can do with with setting up minimum security standards. I call it cyber cyber hygiene. I mean, you have to you have to wash your hands. Uh, you you have to have a, a, a minimum identity security controls. You have to have vulnerability management. Uh, 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 certain things that are are minimum if you want to conduct and and deliver this uh, this service. Um, it may be similar to the the, the, the recent cybersecurity maturity model that, uh, that the DoD uh, in, in the U.S. launched to have different levels, perhaps of of what what is your maturity uh, uh, level, um, and uh, and and then maybe help the, the the buyer with some sort of buyer's guide. You should make sure you're looking at these these uh, uh, the, the level of your your MSP uh, uh, supplier because you can be vulnerable and you can you, you can go out of business because uh, because of this so uh, I, I, I think there's some education needed also on the uh, on the customer side especially as we as we talk about the the smaller organizations um, the world has come a long way for for the person on the street to, to understand cybersecurity to understand ransomware things that uh, John and I probably had to, to explain to uh, uh, to, to family members over the years now are now our, our common uh, discussions. I think it's pretty clear what what it means to a, a business to, to be attacked by ransomware, and therefore there's there's more room to build on on some sort of a buyer's guide and, and education to uh, to the business. John, do you have any kind of any thoughts on that, or uh, you know how businesses can actually use? Um, security as a differentiator uh, in, in the market. Yes, uh, and look, I think a lot of us know people that run small businesses, and I've, I've seen a sea change in the attitude towards security uh, over the last several years, and, and honestly, the last several months. You know, there's been so many high-profile events uh, in the cyberspace globally that, that people are, are scared, you know, so they're starting to say, what do we do? we got to do something different. You know, how do we enhance our security controls? And some of it starts off with the insurance industry because um, a friend of mine actually runs a construction business. And, you know, he went out to get a cyber insurance policy because he was afraid of getting ransomed. And the insurance company gave them a checklist of all of the things that they needed to do before they would qualify for insurance. So, so that was a forcing function for, for that company, which is a, you know, small to mid-sized business have to go out and, and implement all these security controls just to qualify for the uh, the, uh, the ransomware insurance policy, the cyber insurance policy. So that that was a forcing function that I think is helpful. Um, I roll back the clock to the days and I've been I've been on this planet for quite a while now. And you know, we didn't have to wear seatbelts when I was growing up. And then seatbelts became legally required. 
And then companies actually began to go from defensive, like, oh, you have to wear a seatbelt to look how safe my car is. I've got driver's side airbag. I got airbags on the side. I've got these windows. We've got crumple zones. So the industry began to compete based on the safety and security of the vehicle. I think, I think the security industry is going to go similar ways and across and across the orientation of people today that it's such a front headline issue that people realize they need to actually wake up and change the way they do business and Im implement security into every aspect of what they do because the economic consequences are real and in some cases fatal you know, for their business and their ability to serve their customers. So I, I, I see a change actually. And there's, there's forcing functions that come from regulatory environments. Although I can't remember the last time we responded to a breach where the company that was the victim was, was not compliant with whatever their minimum standards were. So, so regulations aren't going to drive great secure outcomes. Um, incentives are and, and helping customers understand the requirements that they need to actually implement uh, to be more secure. It can't be totally secure, but to be more secure and make them a harder target. Uh, so I think some of the, the things that Udi talked about is having guidelines out there. Here's a minimum kind of requirement that you should expect to have if you're in this type of business and this size business. And here's what you should hold your, your managed security provider, or managed service provider accountable to these minimum standards if you're going to entrust them uh, with your crown jewels because they get affected. All somebody does is grab you know, the ability to have escalated privileges in your downstream environment you know, there's plausible deniability because they could argue that they got that access some other way. You can't tie it to them necessarily. So you bear the pain of someone else's loss, uh, you know, of your credentials in, in those scenarios. Um, and, and uh, you know, there should be consequences for that. So I think, I think education is the first part of this. Um, and the, the media and the world and the adversary, frankly, has delivered such impact to us globally. Um, that people have, I've, 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 I feel like they're wakening up to the problem and actually you're starting to address it. I mean, do you feel the same way? Have you seen a change in the market in the last several months and years? Yeah, I, I, I always get, uh, I, I was worried, I would say, in the early years of, uh, of CyberArk where, where we deliver privilege access management security solutions to customers and exactly defending against that escalation that, that, that John talked about. And they would say, yeah, we want to put this layer in on these servers because we failed an audit. Uh, but uh, but the hacker is not going to show up and say, okay, are you compliant or not? I'll go to the, uh, if you were compliant, I'll back off. And that, that always worried me. And uh, we used to say, look, compliance is, is, is a guideline. It's, it's showing you the, uh, the path, but think, think cybersecurity, think like an attacker and, and, uh, uh, and go, go defense in depth. I do see a change um, with the, the, the chief security officers out there in, in, in government, in, uh, in, in enterprises, uh, really thinking more about uh, this could happen to anyone. It happened to defense organizations. It could happen to anyone. I have to think. Um, I have to think like an attacker. I have to think uh, uh, that compliance is a guideline. So there, there is a there is a positive change. And and I think like we said earlier, the further the further you go to smaller organizations, that that becomes a little harder. They won't have necessarily a chief security officer on staff, and and they rely on on the third uh, on the third parties. But the education is. Is seeping into the board level, and and uh, and board members are asking questions about uh, about cybersecurity posture. Yeah, that that that's a that's a key shift, and I think the board the board effectively has to be the regulator, you know, for the business. If they feel personal reliability or personal personal liability associated with making sure that they have a secure business, and they hold the leadership team accountable uh, to implement, you know, solid security programs that they can independently validate on the side. I mean, that's, that's really the only way to uh, delivering outcomes, you know, for the shareholders. Uh, it's it's got to be something that's not a nice to have, it's a need to have, and they're held accountable from the leadership of the board. And the board is held accountable uh, to actually have those companies implement uh, solid security programs. So, so there's a, there's, there's a, there's been a few points around kind of, um, the need to have some sort of requirement regulation as a as a minimum as a baseline as a as a starting point but that on its own kind of won't, wouldn't be enough and so there's a there's a whole range of incentives that need to be provided awareness is a big point uh, and i think that this last this last conversation around um 
board um, uh, boards being responsible and held accountable for this is that is absolutely kind of um, uh, important to to change the culture in the rest of the organisation because we're not you know we we John you you might want to want to come in on this you might have seen quite a lot of this and and Udi as well um, having a compliance culture can actually be quite damaging to to an organisation rather than actually a culture of of security and that's driven from the board level down. Um, I don't know if there are any experiences of that that you might want to uh, uh, to, to bring to this. Yeah, I, th I think that's a really good point. I mean, look, you need to be compliant by default, not by design. So security programs that are built to be compliant, and if they have a little money left over, they'll try to be secure, um, are never going to be as effective as programs that are built to be secure, and along the way, they happen to be compliant. You know, so, so, you know, in the early days, uh, really early days being five, 10 years ago, so many of the, the highly regulated industries, their priority was to be compliant. Um, and then they would try to negotiate to get additional money to actually try to become more secure than the baseline was. But it was just, it was a plus, it wasn't the core. And uh, that's, that's begun to shift dramatically. So people now are trying to be secure by design and compliant by default. And that's a much better orientation uh, to investing money in security. U Udi, do you want to add, add anything to that? Oh, it's exactly it's exactly that uh, that, that positive uh, shift. Um, and and uh, uh, in, uh, I, I remember, uh, again, it wasn't just a few years ago where a panel of chief security officers would talk about the auditor as the enemy. Uh, and 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 yeah, and then when the auditor showed up, this is how we were able to answer it. And I would sit there and think, oh my God, we have so much to do in educating them that the auditor is is is, you know, is on your team, is trying to, to poke a, fat, a flashlight, and um, and you have to defend against against an adversary that that's that's out there, and and even against insider threat. Um, I think today, if we were to randomly pull a panel of chief chief security officers in in, in enterprise. They would talk about um, uh, the same theme that, that John talked about now is, is how do we reduce risk? How do we protect our enterprise? Uh, if we were to pull, um, uh, but if we were to go downstream, we, we probably, there's still more education uh, uh, to go. And, 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 and I'm, I'm, I am optimistic that, uh, that cybersecurity is becoming a, uh, an inherent part of running a business, running, running government, and that the next generation um, would, would give it a, as much attention as they give accounting and, and the audit committee of a board. Yeah, yeah. I mean, for, fortunately, there's ways now to actually validate your security effectiveness through technology. You know, until, until recently, you know, if, if a board asked a CISO to define how secure the program was, you know, there'd be a lot of words and there's a mammoth communication catch between the security talk and the board talk where the board would kind of say, all right, well, how much money do you need? I'll just, I'll just throw money at it. But there's, because there's no way to, to measure the effectiveness of your security. Uh, that really industry is, is burgeoning today and creating an opportunity for companies to say, can I really test the control of the effectiveness of my security program against threats that are relevant to my industry? And as those technologies are maturing um, and becoming easier to implement, you now have an opportunity to run security as a business function. Because every business manager knows that you can't manage what you can't measure. So how do you measure, you know, your security program? Is it an annual audit? Is it a, you know, bring in a third party assessor to give you a scorecard at a point in time? Or is there a way to implement a security effectiveness program that constantly measures and benchmarks yourself, not only against your prior security posture, but against your peer group to, to have a constant improvement program in security? Because make no doubt, Make no mistake, the adversary is innovating. And the adversary has innovated at a pace in excess of security programs. So unless you have a way to tie your innovation pace to the innovation pace of the adversary, the security gap I defined initially will continue to grow wider and wider, uh, which is a trajectory that I don't believe is tenable, um, just as a global, global citizen. So it's something we have to, we have to change the way we do business. And, and then and then back to our, uh, we can connect everything that John just said to the MSPs and to the supply chain. That same approach uh, cannot be, yeah, we've assessed our security and very inwardly thinking. Assessing your security has to also include assessing your suppliers and, and especially the ones who come in with strong access. 
yeah, yeah, no, um, um, complete, complete, um, completely on the on the right tracks. I think um, I won't um, I won't delve into the uh, issues around security audits because I uh, you know used to be a security auditor uh, in in a past life, but uh, I, I try to forget that now. Um, there's a question that's um, that's come in from the audience, which I'll, I'll come on to uh, in a second. Um, and just a reminder to those watching that that you do have the opportunity to submit questions for. For the panel to answer, but John, you touched on this as being a global issue um, moments ago. Um, how how is this um, issue different for, I guess, um, technology or digital digital companies in the US or the UK compared to um, you know tech companies starting up in other parts of the world or even other companies in other parts of the world? Is, is this very much a kind of um, US Europe uh, issue, or is this uh, something that we need to be worried about more globally? So, so I would argue that when I when I reflected those total losses due to cybersecurity and the total spend on cybersecurity, um, you know, a, a large percentage of that was in you know the U.S. and and Western Europe. Although many parts of Asia have actually started to experience this, and many other parts of the world look at the you know the meat packer in, in Brazil. So this is becoming a global issue rapidly, and uh, people are going to hit soft spots. And there's geopolitical triggers for everything in cyberspace, you see, whether it is a country giving safe harbor to criminals to operate without any consequence, like in Russia and, and, and the recent type of attacks you've seen coming out of there, um, to, you know, the, the U.S. getting into a, 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 a spat with someone else around the world, like in North Korea, and begin to apply hard economic sanctions. And then who's the victim? Bank of Bangladesh, right? Because it's a soft target. So. So people aren't just going to go symmetrically back at the core of the problem. They're going to go somewhere else to a weak target and hit them. So I think the, the explosion in ransomware has changed, has changed the landscape of targets to where, you know, the, the original question 10 years ago, well, why would someone target me? I'm a grocery store or I'm just a retail chain or I sell plumbing parts. Why would I, why would I be a target? You know, it's because you have money. <laughs> it doesn't matter what you do. It matters what you have. You either have customer credentials that are a target. You have cash. You know, you as a, as a reasonable sized business, you're a target. So, uh, you know, the, tar the targeting is globally distributed now and is going after weak targets around the world. Would a small business in, in a smaller country likely be a target? No. But that said, is the sophistication and automation that's built into these attackers' methodologies now, particularly through supply chain and suppliers, allows a one-to-many to affect multiple companies all over the world. I mean, take take like at a supply chain attack, you know, with Russia against the Ukraine, you know, it's not Petya, uh, where where they got upstream into one of the tax software providers. They rolled out a tax software update to all the various companies in the Ukraine. This actually spilled. Way, well outside the Ukraine, uh, but it went in and infected all those companies and encrypted their data, what was supposed to be ransomware, but there was no, there was no ability to pay the ransom. It was really just destructive malware, you know, the masquerading as ransomware. And, and th that was a way that just hit a lot of small to mid-sized businesses that would never be targets. They're just, they weren't a target of choice, they were a target of chance, which is increasingly becoming the risk as you move into these supply chain attacks and you're infecting all other downstream victims um, that, that, you know, in, in their right mind, they would say, well, why would anybody, you know, attack me? I mean, they're being attacked now. This is, this is a global issue. And as the supply chain um, dependencies have grown and more and more of these companies are relying on their supply chain of MSPs and MSSPs and all the cloud hosters, you're going to see more and more in this type of a threat proliferation hit a lot of unwitting targets. Um, that's gonna that's gonna be incredibly impactful. Uh, so so that we've seen the damage skyrocket literally this year. And I would add that the adoption of MSPs are fun from all the reasons you mentioned, the positive reasons where they they help in digital transformation. Those small businesses or medium businesses don't don't have to become experts uh, in in CRM or in or in other uh, elements that help them accelerate the business. Uh, and uh, and that's everywhere. We're, we're we're in over 100 countries. We're seeing vast adoption of, of MSPs by by businesses, uh, uh, including Latin America and and uh, 
and Eastern Europe and, and really around the world. And so the, to, to John's point, maybe they wouldn't target the grocery store, but if they could target the MSP and get to uh, uh, 500 uh, 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 small businesses, then, then it's definitely a worthwhile uh, uh, target. And therefore, I think the issue we're discussing here in this panel definitely applies uh, on a global basis. Yeah, it's, it's, it's a really important one, actually, because I think, you know, you both talked about this global supply chain and global um, customer base as well. Uh, and so actually, we could end up with a situation where, uh, you know, customers in particular countries uh, that adopt uh, certain regulatory or um, uh, standards or practices, uh, you know, actually drive up the price of an attack um, through supply chains. Uh, and so you'll find that, you know, without a co coordinated global response, uh, it will be the countries that do less, which will, you know, often be or, or, or could be countries with, with fewer resources around this that actually uh, find themselves um, or their businesses suffering, uh, suffering the most out of this. Um, I'll turn to, to a couple of the, the questions that have come in. Uh, John, you talked about, um, you know, the requirements of insurances. Um, uh, assurance companies uh, how how um, sorry the first part is what should insurances require before offering coverage and secondly how are they avoiding uh, sorry how are they avoiding uh, the requirements are effective and not a mere um, check uh, checklist um, issue uh, the, the, the compliance culture that, that you talked about before yeah, good question. Uh, the, the security requirements really depends on the, the nature of the business that they're providing the insurance to, the size of the business, the complexity of the business, how distributed their infrastructure is. Uh, but they've got different basic check lines, and it's almost the security maturity model. Uh, they got to be at a, a minimum level maturity model implementation to to hit a, a hit a standard where the threshold where they actually insure them, and the actual premiums are underwritten to where the more they actually improve their security, the less the security premium is. So there's a natural incentive system there uh, to, to you know, uh, provide better, more attractive insurance offerings to those people that are more secure. So rather than going into the detail of what you implement in terms of best practices, that's, you know, that's in all kinds of, uh, you know, NIST top 20 and all these other guidelines that they, that they point to. But I think there's a more important question there is how do you know or how do you test the effectiveness and again, I think that really validates the part of the industry that's emerging quickly in terms of validation of security effectiveness through technology. How do you take you know, common attacker methodologies and run it in a customer environment to validate whether or not they're effective? That gives an assurance company a scaled way to effectively underwrite their customers through technology and deliver it efficiently and at scale. So I think, I think the security validation is going to really begin to take on um, a, a larger and larger role and the help of security company or insurance companies underwriting their customers and continuously updating to test whether or not those security controls are being effective and deployed effectively. So, um, so, that, so that's one piece of this that, that, is, that is super important. <laughs> I, I would take it to another level though on the insurance companies themselves. I mean, one of the most protected documents in, in the physical world is a, is a K&R policy, a kidnap and ransom policy. So if you've got executives in a company that, that travel abroad with families, a lot of oil and gas executives who live in parts of the world where there's a real kidnapping risk for them and their families, they have these kidnap and ransom policies. They never want to have them online. Nobody ever talks about it because they're sacred. You don't want to put a target on a family you know, living abroad. In the cybersecurity industry, I mean, I spoke at a conference, you know, a couple of years ago, and I said, what percentage of the agents in the room as a cyber insurance company have all of their customers on their laptop right now with the amount of the policy, the name of the customer and the amount of the policy on their laptop, and that's dialed into this insecure hotel network? Almost all of them. I said, if I'm a bad guy, I know exactly where I am right now. I'm out in the hallway going through all of the list of your customers. And you wonder why Sabranson was gone from paying $1,000 or $2,000 like it used to be to paying these numbers. You target the cyber insurance industry, you know exactly who their customers are and exactly what they're willing to pay in ransom because it's insured. So the loss profiles exploded um, you know, over the last year or two as the ransom numbers have begun to go up and approach the ability to pay, which for the proliferation of cyber insurance customers is what they're insured for. 
Um, so I think those two are correlated in terms of the risk to the industry and the, the kind of what turns into a virtuous cycle on this, unfortunately, is losses create a change in business behavior where cyber insurance providers had very minimum thresholds that you had to meet to qualify for a policy as recent as a year or two ago. So these standards that I've talked about that they're raising is just a business resilience requirement. They actually have to tackle the problem for their customers by enforcing a level of security a control and effectiveness review for their customers before they can take the risk in the insurance policy. Um, so it's a, it's a, a, ultimately, I think it's going to be a really good thing to have the cyber insurance industry begin to require uh, and incentivize those customers to put the proper security programs in place. I think that's almost a more effective form of regulation uh, than having a government, you know, organization come up with some set of compliance rules. Yeah, and um, so the the insurance point, I think, I think insurance has got an increasingly important role to play in, uh, you know, not just um, recovery, but also the preventative uh, side that, that we that we kind of um, uh, should be prioritizing and trying to prioritize. You know, the the, the points that you raised are around, um, I guess, any company, right? Any company that values its digital estate and relies on its digital estate. Um, should be considering these points. Is there a special case for managed service providers um, or specific kind of important managed service providers? Uh, and and um, you know there are there are particular sectors of the economy where certain types of insurance is mandatory. Should certain types should cyber insurance be mandatory in certain managed service provider sectors groups? You know we saw a uh, managed service um, go down today for a couple of hours and and the uh, Twitter went a bit crazy because they thought the internet shut down and the world was ending. Um, are there, um, are there, are there, is there a case for, for that kind of specific um, uh, requirement for insurance uh, in, in the managed service provider um, sector? I think it's, I yeah. think it's, we're, we're, we're uncovering here that it's one of the ways to, uh, uh, to create a self-regulating uh, mechanism that's less of a, of, a, of a government involvement. If you just in, in force the, the, the fact that you need a cyber insurance policy, you will at least get some of these best practices in, in place. So I would say yes, uh, especially on, on certain uh, verticals to, to, to force uh, them having that. Um, it's, it's, not, it's not the silver bullet against everything, but it would be an, another way to, uh, to trickle down best practices to, to all of the MSPs. Yeah, it's, it's also a good incentive system to the extent that, let's, let's use this, this uh, friend of mine I was referring to, if he had the ability to use a managed security service provider that, that came with an insurance policy, so if the answer was simply hire this, this company and they'll run your security program for you, they'll implement all the controls and they'll manage it for you, you know, 24-7, 365, that qualifies for this attractive insurance policy rate. Uh, by virtue of that relationship, now that starts to put all the incentives in place. And if the insurance company then had the requirement to underwrite that that managed service provider uh, continuously to, to make sure that they're effective, because that's really where their risk is concentrated now. Because if they got affected, they could affect a lot of downstream customers that would ultimately create you know a, a ripple effect of losses for them. Uh, that's that's a that's a good type of of circular incentive system. To do the right thing in security, uh, all coming back to the simple point is you have to be able to you have to be able to measure it to manage it. So the the, the measurement of security effectiveness and having an ability to implement that through software and continuously is going to be really important, I think, going forward. And the need for some kind of independence in terms of of uh, you know validating someone's security controls, whether it's an independent you know like a Moody's or an S and P or some kind of entity that's an independent credit rating agency. If you could come up with some kind of an independent cybersecurity rating um, agency that would actually go test people and, and uh, come up with a consistent standard so you could know what you're doing business with. Because you may say this managed service provider um, is a four out of five stars and it's a 10,000 a month, but this other one's five out of five stars and it's 11,000 a month. I'll pay the 11,000. You know, then you can actually incentivize good behavior uh, through just basic economic alignment. Um, so a kind of uh, cybersecurity trip advisor 
uh, type type function where you can actually uh, yeah rate rate organization. Um, yeah, so we're talking about well, startups in this space. So there's 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 starting to be you know um, at least investment and movement in that direction. Um, we've talked a, a bit about what companies should be doing uh, and what uh, what we can be incentivizing them to do. Um, I don't know, Udi, have you have you come across or have you seen uh, places where MSPs have actually got this right that can act uh, uh, act as a model? Uh, what are the what are the kinds of things that you've seen as as good practice in this sector? Uh, absolutely, and I and I think we've we're, we're, we've all been mostly optimistic in this session, but I, I do I do want to insert that uh, in here that. Uh, there are examples of MSPs, especially managed security services providers. So they, 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 what they, what they provide is security services that put security as their differentiator. They actually highlight this is what we do. We're uh, we're eating our own dog food or drinking our own champagne. We're investing in um, in security. Uh, we we have many partners uh, out there throughout the world that. Uh, uh, when when we when we visit them as partners as MSPs and MSSPs, we actually see that they before launching out a program uh, for their customers, they actually invest in their own uh, in their own security, whether it's in in identity security or or other elements to make sure that they are not the weak link um, in 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 uh, the attack to uh, to their customers and to actually be the ones that are leveling up uh, the security of 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 their customers. I've seen it both in, in, in large uh, MSPs, which we would expect, but I also seen it in, in, in specialty uh, type MSPs that, that decided that this, this is actually going to be our differentiator. Uh, we'll, we'll, we can charge more, uh, to, to John's earlier point, and we make it a, a, a premium type uh, service, and, um, and, we, we, and we do the right thing. And, and uh, they also hire staff for security, and they hire chief security officers, and they invest in cybersecurity uh, technologies. And so there are MSPs that get it right, kind of self-regulated. So, so it's kind of the, the they do this for uh, because they they want to uh, differentiate. I don't think the regulation or the the that we talked about would would uh, would in any way hurt them. They they would just shine above the minimum standards. John, you would have seen a, a couple of instances of where managed service providers have uh, had had issues uh, in the in the last year. Um, I guess there's. That, you know what one of the issues is that there's a lot that a managed server provider has to invest in cyber security to keep its customers safe that its customers may never see or hear about how do you um you know how, how have you seen um companies doing this well and uh you know how, how would you suggest that they take on this problem and and work with their customers or provide awareness to their customers or communicate with their customers around this specific part of a service which isn't necessarily the the core part of the service they're trying to deliver to their customers. Yeah, I mean, I, kind of to Udi's point on differentiating their service based on security, you know, people when they transfer risk to a managed security services provider or a managed you know, service provider in general, uh, expect security to be just part of the package. You know, they expect that service to be secure and, and have not been um, oriented around paying for a different level of security. There's no tiers of security to where the con the concept is uh, um, is is implausible for a managed service provider to say, "I'm not going to secure your data because you didn't pay for this premium offering. I'm only I'm going to secure yours because you did, and we got differentiated security for you." That it's just not a plausible outcome. So they have to provide the same security uh, effectiveness and controls to all of their customers. So those folks that take it seriously, and most of them do. I mean, this isn't, we're not, we're not here trying to, to, to shine a light on the managed security providers as, as insecure entities. I mean, most of the ones we deal with are, are very, very passionate about securing their own environment and their, their customers' data. Um, that is priority number one for these companies. Um, but there is a balance, there's a delicate balance between you know, how, how much are you gonna push the envelope towards security beyond what's reasonable to compete effectively in your industry. And, and, and I think that's gonna have to be a reflection where customers vote with their wallets and to the extent somebody brands behind and illustrates uh, the, the, the level of maturity of their environment, they're public with all of their security audits, you know, they, they hold themselves accountable to the highest standard and they brand behind that as a differentiator, um, is going to give customers confidence 
um, in the, in that uh, in that provider. And and I think it's 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 increasingly becoming a security differentiator. I mean, my, my, my wife won't buy a car unless she looks up all the safety ratings on it, right? Because you got the independent ratings say, what's the safety rating of this particular car? She's going to put a grandbaby in it. She's going to want to know that's the safest car out there. And same kind of thing with these secured service providers, which begs to the, the question of where is the independence in terms of truly, you know, coming up with an effectiveness standard of a, of a service provider. I think the industry is in desperate need of that. Yeah. You, you, have you seen any anything um, from your from your experience where this is um, this has provided the insight that that um, customers need or, or or require to make these decisions uh, well? I, I've seen where where uh, customers have gone out for an RFP and used uh, kind of an external uh, advisory firm or others to help them with the the cybersecurity chapter or or or, or specialists. And um, and so maybe they didn't have the insights on their own, but before selecting a, a an MSP, kind of had a chapter on security that that came that was written by professionals, and um, and it made the difference. And 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 in many cases, they didn't have to invent uh, the wheel. They they could take uh, some of the best practices out there, like NIST, and and put uh, and put requirements um, and and select based on that. And and uh, and and so I think that is uh, that that is happening as well. Brilliant. Um, we've had we've had a question specifically for you, uh, UD, on um, on something you mentioned earlier around uh, the uh, threat of the insider. So I guess when uh, organisations are looking at their cyber security um, posture and risk management, uh, it forms part of their broader kind of digital um, risk picture. Uh, and the question is, uh, are there any um, assessment, certification, or standards that are considered sufficient and/or important for addressing the insider threat risk? I'll, I'll say something maybe a little bit controversial, but we live and breathe it for, for so many years. The good news is that you don't have to differentiate anymore between an insider and an external attacker, but it's for a bad reason. In the early years, when, when, when we came out with privilege access management and the security you put within, there was an assumption that only an insider would get to this level of control with this amount of access, and therefore this is the security we have to put in place. I think with uh, advanced persistent threat and, um, and, and the examples of, of the solar wind uh, example, uh, companies today have to assume breach and they have to assume that the adversary knows how to land on even specific uh, uh, computers and systems uh, inside. And therefore, the, the differentiator between that could be coming, this threat can be coming from an insider only uh, versus this is for the outsider only. Uh, is not applicable anymore. Probably in the last 10 years, it's it, that that uh, that the perimeter has has uh, evaporated. Why is it good news? Is that it creates this clarity for the chief security officer that I have to defend and assume that the motivated attacker will make it inside, and I have to defend and assume that I may have attacks emanating from inside, and therefore this is my uh, my risk assumption. And uh, and of course it, it 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 levels up the types of controls that organizations have to put. Uh, uh, have to put inside uh, segregations, uh, uh, a strong access uh, uh, controls, kind of assuming, okay, if somebody landed here, how do I prevent them from moving from uh, laterally and, and, and escalating uh, privileges? But it, at least it creates clarity for the, for the defender in, 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 in this, and there's no, there's no silver bullet. It's really following those, those best practices of, of, uh, of uh, defense in depth Zero trust is a, is a good framework to, to think about it. I, I can't really trust any uh, device in my network and, uh, and, and the, uh, the perimeter has evaporated. John, anything to add to that? I, I couldn't agree more. I think, I think you did a great job articulating it. And it was a big frustration for me in my, in my years in this industry. People say, oh, we're, not, we're not that worried about external threats, we're about internal threats. So well, how do you think you create an insider threat? <laughs> I mean, you, you have to just gain access to uh, an ability to escalate privileges from a particular insider, and you're basically an insider. So it might manifest itself as insider threat, but it was externally generated and externally controlled. So the, the, Udi's point is spot on. And I think really what it's done is point to uh, really the, the source challenge that we face as an industry that creates this economic gap we talked about with the trajectory we're on um, being so expensive to the economy. And it's basically we've relied on security controls over the last 20 years 
uh, to to help protect us from these bad things. We put layers of security all over the place. Um, and, and this explosion of the attack servers from OT and IoT and mobile and work from home and all these different different access points in your environment create this relatively infinite attack surface. Uh, you know, and defensively, you have to be right all the time. Offensively, you only have to be right one time. You know, so this this really the, this this disproportionate advantage goes to the adversary in that kind of reality. So unless you assume that they can get in as your baseline and then attack the problem and say, how do I go find an adversary from inside my organization and use a zero trust mentality and uh, application of that zero trust framework internally, you really don't stand a chance. So you can't just, you know, look at all the flashing lights from your device and say, I guess they're blocking bad things for me or they detected really what matters. Um, for me, that's a tipping and queuing system. All those controls give some evidence that something anomalous is happening. So you got to find that fast. Once you find it fast, how do you actually try to build some insight into who the adversary may be or the capabilities you're going to use? And then you automatically have to pivot into a proactive energy. You know, looking for them in your environment from proactively hunting for the adversary in your environment, uh, trying to remove them from your, your, your different parts of your infrastructure they may have gained access to, any evidence that there is privilege escalation or data exfiltration, um, and constantly checking your security controls against those adversaries that are most likely to target you. It's a, it's a different orientation, but, but for sure, uh, if we don't do things differently the next 10 years than we do the last 10 years, I mean, the consequences are surreal in terms of the global economy and all the relative businesses that we, we operate in around the world. And uh, this isn't, you know, some happy moment for security. I hate it when people think that way. It's a very unhappy time for all of us that are global participants to, to watch this, uh, this tax explode on the global economy, and particularly how it's now being distributed beyond those that can afford to lose. I don't think anybody's going to feel bad for a, a big global bank if they lose 100 million bucks, but if it puts a small business out of business or mid-sized business can't compete effectively because they're crippled and, and they don't have the ability to unlock their infrastructure that's been, been you know, encrypted, I mean, that, that, that's real life consequences. Those are people that we all know and interact with in our, in our communities. And as the damage is, is rippling far beyond the, just the large companies today, um, it requires a change in, in the way we do business. Yeah, yeah. And it's those businesses that have, um, you know, certainly during COVID, but not, not just because of, and, and, and it probably won't stop now, that have, have an even uh, stronger reliance on those um, those managed service providers and those platforms, um, and you know, you know, have have sought to kind of exploit an opportunity in, uh, you know, working remotely and digitization and, and and this kind of trend that we've seen in the last uh, year that, that are even more vulnerable than others in in, in that um, in that area. Yeah, MSPs have to be a route to the future. I mean, there's there's all these little companies aren't going to have the ability to to afford or implement or manage and have the skills to manage security yeah. infrastructure. Uh, this has to be provided through an as a service layer that's easy to implement, easy to manage, where the yeah. third party is held accountable to their security standard and actually affords some confidence down to the customer and maybe even some insurance down to the customer that if something bad happens, it's not going to put them out of business. They'll be in a position to be able to recover from it. Yeah. And it's not just the security um, service providers, right? We're talking about companies that run um, customer relation, you know, CRM systems, uh, uh, companies that run content delivery networks, customers that run uh, companies that run kind of websites and uh, booking payroll. systems and payroll and, you know, all of this, uh, you know, the, the, the more, you know, the, 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 the more accessible these uh, specializations become through virtualization, the more advantages small companies have in exploiting these opportunities, but then, the, you know, you're absolutely right, John. We need to get this uh, managed service provider point right. Uh, there's yeah, been a question. The, uh, Sorry. Yeah, it's 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 the entire ecosystem that a business relies on to function. Yeah. I mean, it's that it's that whole technical ecosystem uh, that, to your point, in many ways is very distributed from payroll providers to infrastructure providers to cloud providers to security providers. I mean, that all that enabling um, um, connective tissue is the ecosystem that re that is has to be has to be uh, um, resilient in order for the company to be able to execute on its core business of serving customers and selling widgets or doing whatever that business does. Um, it relies on that ecosystem. 
and the ecosystem has to be resilient and they should have the scale to be resilient um, for a customer to, to rely on them. Yeah. And yeah. um, Udi, did you want to come, come in on that? Um, I, I saw you. Um... No, no, I perfectly, I perfectly agree. I, I, I want the audience to actually to feel the opportunity. And I think you, you touched it uh, in, in the opening. This is actually MSPs and digital transformation. And even, even this year of COVID has given more types of businesses the opportunity to digitize and be part of the digital economy. We're, we're seeing it everywhere. We can order from a small grocery uh, online uh, these days. So that's the, the opportunity part. But with it comes the, 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 um, the, the adversary and, and, uh, and exploiting the fact that there's now the, the one to many uh, avenues yeah. to, to attack these businesses. And, uh, and I think uh, the, the pendulum has swung too far uh, to, to the attackers and uh, together, I'm really pleased that we were putting it up in, in such an important forum. Uh, we, we, we can we can swing the pendulum uh, gradually back to the defenders. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, John, there was a question around the uh, cybersecurity rating system uh, for MSPs. Uh, the question is, would this need to be global and what role does government have to play in it? Uh, and finally, how can it be trusted? Um, I, I think it has to be global. I think it has to be operated through an independent you know, entity. It can be a for-profit entity. That's fine as long as they don't have any entanglements with the companies that they're validating their security effectiveness with. Um, but, but there's opportunities here for anywhere from, from global consulting firms, global um, you know, rating firms to, to, to shine a light on a consistent application of a security effectiveness measurement uh, globally to all customers. And, and I think there's a great opportunity here for businesses to, to, to fill that gap and provide a level of confidence for customers around the world that, that your provider uh, meets a certain level of standard that you can feel comfortable that, that uh, there's some independent eyes on that provider because you don't have the ability to assess them, uh, that you have trust and faith in. I mean, we've done it in most industries in terms of safety standards and security standards. Uh, to me, it's amazing that the cybersecurity industry has become as, as mature as it is without a, without a third party standard that we can rely upon, um, um, particularly in this more cons risk consolidation zone. We're coming out of the, such systemic risk as we consolidate more and more risk into fewer and fewer companies that we have to have a third party standard that we can rely on. Um, uh, to have faith in the, in the in the efficacy of that rating, and I, I would say in the interim, and uh, because it's going to take time to have uh, to have a, a global the, the countries that are that are represented here and the cybersecurity authorities, uh, especially in small in the smaller countries, uh, can put uh, measures in place or, or guidelines in place already for the MSPs and, and minimum security practices in in the interim um, un, until until we have a, a global standard. Uh, your friend, you're, you're muted. Brilliant. Um, that that point around more and more um, risk being consolidated into fewer and fewer companies, John. That um, do you see that? Um, do you see events like Solar Winds and and others um, uh, having an impact on people's confidence in using uh, MSPs? And do you think, you know, um, do you think that that will reduce uh, uh, companies' willingness to, to, to use uh, managed service providers? I think they'll rethink it for about two nanoseconds, then they'll do what they've always done before. <laughs> there, this, the, the economics are gonna, gonna drive, and the, the immovable, immovable trends to the cloud and consolidated infrastructure management, consolidated service provider management uh, is just, is not going to reverse anytime soon. I can't see it happening. So, so it used to be the holdouts were financials and government. Now financials and government are moving to the cloud and moving to, to third-party MSP. So I think this trend of consolidation is going to continue. Um, and, and systemically, we're going to have more and more risk and fewer and fewer companies um, that, that uh, um, in theory, and I believe also in practice, have far and away the best opportunity to secure that infrastructure versus all their downstream customers independently trying to secure their infrastructure and, and their, their data. So I don't think the trend is a negative, it's just a reality. 
Um, I don't think it's going to be reversed by any of these high level um, events. I mean, maybe if you saw like a major cloud provider go down, I mean, th that, that might be an aha moment where people rethink it and can and begin to reverse trend. But I haven't seen anything to lead me to believe that the trend is going to reverse anytime soon. Udi, have you seen any indication of that? No, and I think the skill set is also in line with that. There's such a shortage in skill set. It's only, uh, you know, amplifying over the years. And, and it's going to be very hard to reverse and bring that skill set back into the businesses and the smaller mm -hmm. organizations. So they do rely on this outsourcing and the MSP. And, and there's so much shortage, especially, um, you know, in, in general with, with technical uh, skills, but definitely with, uh, with security, uh, with, with the security skills. So I don't think so. The, the solar winds can be a, a, a positive turning point for, for this awareness of supply chain. I, I don't think it was a, a something that boards knew how to pronounce before, and now they do. They, they will ask about what is our supply chain risk and, and, and ask uh, and ask their, their chief security officer to, to, to define that and, and dive deeper into that. So that that is a positive um, outcome of this. Are you, um, uh, you know, on, on companies managing their supply chain risk better, Udi and, and John, both of you, I guess, are you seeing uh, customers take uh, a, a better approach to this than kind of pulling out the checklist? Are you are you seeing a change in behavior as a result of kind of what we've seen in the last year? On the yeah, enterprise yeah. side, I, oh sorry, uh, on the ahead, enterprise, uh, when it comes to enterprises that we're dealing with, uh, you know, the, the, the major banks, insurance companies, uh, others, uh, definitely seeing that this this opened kind of a new chapter of how they they review their uh, their security uh, posture, and um, and how they review their uh, their their vendors, uh, for sure. I, I I'm not sure it trickled down into into smaller organizations. Yeah, there's I mean there's emerging companies. Uh, that are still small businesses in the schema thing that that are really focused just on vendor risk management and trying to have some shared shared equities model to where you know if you do an assessment on one supplier that you know thousands of companies use you know you only have to do that assessment once and you can share it with those thousands of customers as a way to have some leverage and delivering confidence to upstream service providers so i think there's there's business models out there today that as they become more scaled you're gonna have an opportunity to have a simple one-stop validation hub that says, okay, here's my portfolio of suppliers, my most critical ones, and there's a way I can go to know that there's independent validation taking place of their security effectiveness uh, that gives me confidence that that uh, you know I'm at the right, I'm with the right partner. Sorry, I am. Um uh, got got logged out there for a second, but um, I think it's it's good to see that there's a kind of positive um, a move in the right direction on this from from the kind of companies that we would we would want to see this from. I think we've probably got time for just one more uh, one more question, and um, it's around uh, how different countries are approaching this. So I suppose you know one of the reasons why it's important for this to be considered in this forum forum is because. Um, you know, it's a problem that is being faced by by many different countries and many different uh, economies. Uh, but uh, you know, having a uh, fragmented approach across different countries uh, would have an would, you know, there, there's a compliance cost which we know about, which uh, would would be detrimental to companies. Is there a risk that you know, in the same way that uh, some companies uh, can can base themselves in countries with low tax rates? That managed service providers uh, would actually move to base themselves in jurisdictions which don't require this. So, is there actually a risk that doing something on this for a government can be can have a negative impact of, on on the growth of its digital economy and and uh, the companies that are that are based there? Yeah, I mean, I, I'll take a shot at. It. I mean, I think you know, whenever you have to deal with a multi-jurisdictional regulatory environment. I mean, just even in the states, every state has their own regulatory environment. And rather than saying, I'm going to be minimally compliant with each of those states, you say, what is the most, the highest level of, of, of regulatory scrutiny that I'm subject to in all of the jurisdictions and operate in? And I'm going to operate that way consistently globally. So, so for the big companies that operate through multi-jurisdictions and globally, it's much easier to have one high level standard applied everywhere you operate than try to deliver minimal standards wherever you operate. So, so I think there's some incentive there. For the smaller businesses, um, 
ho hopefully people would see through that move if some managed security provider said the regulatory scrutiny is too high in this country so i'm going to move to uh you know some third party jurisdiction out of the bahamas or cayman islands and operate there so they can do something without scrutiny i mean made the cruise industry has done that right so you know to try to try to try to move into the parts where they don't have the same uh legal infrastructure in terms of how they deal with their waste at sea and all that uh, but i would think the security industry is not going to operate that that opportunistically at least i yeah. maybe i'm too uh virtuous in my view of the world but i would hope that's not going to be a direction they take I, I agree with that i think uh again it's, the more we educate downstream also to the customer asking the question they would not look very favorably to to uh, an MSP saying, hey, I can be cheaper because I moved to a jurisdiction that doesn't care about my security posture uh, for you as your customer. So, so if, if we educate both 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 sides, uh, we, we, we can prevent that. Brilliant. Uh, well, thank you both. Um, do you, I guess, are there any kind of um, last thoughts, closing remarks, anything that you think uh, we haven't covered that, that you think the audience should, should hear before we finish for, for the afternoon? Uh, John. Yeah, sure. Uh, I mean, if it's not clear from my opening comments that we have to change the game in security, we have to do things differently than we have in the past. Because if we do the same things over and over again and expect different results, that's certainly not the association we want to have as a as a global economy. So um, I think it's, it's really time to do a global assessment, what's been working and what's not working and how do we do things differently going forward uh, so we can innovate at the pace of the adversary and maintain a consistent pressure on, on, on constantly enhancing our security as the adversary changes their behavior in an automated way. I think it's the only way we can keep up from an innovation pace with the adversary and close that security gap I talked about. Yeah, I just wanna thank you for hosting us and, and really shining a light on this uh, on this topic that touches both ends of the opportunity, the digital transformation that's, that's pushing countries and, and businesses and the, the security elements, uh, the security risks that are amplified and so, um, again, I, I appreciate that we're, we're shining a light on it. And these kind of forums and, uh, and new thinking is, is, uh, is the path to, uh, to change. Thank you. Well, thank you both. I think it's, uh, it's, it's really important to hear from, uh, from the two of you in particular uh, and, uh, on this topic, which is, I think, as, as we've kind of agreed, is not going anywhere and only going to become uh, even more important. Uh, I think from my side, um, the, the thing that I'd leave the audience with is, uh, you know, in, in, in our, as I said at the beginning, in our um, cyber breaches survey in the UK, we found that just 12% of businesses are actually looking at um, cybersecurity risks posed by their suppliers. So this is a real issue and a, an issue that is growing. And, and I don't think the UK would be unique in that in that respect. I think this is a blind spot for companies. Um, and, uh, and I guess finally to uh, direct uh, viewers' attention to the UK call for views. If you have uh, thoughts on how uh, managed service provider security or supply chain security more broadly um, should be handled by government or could be handled or could be uh, what, what could governments could do better about this, please do respond, for, uh, respond to our uh, call for views, which is available on the gov.uk website. So uh, uh, I guess lastly, thank you both uh, again, uh, Udi and uh, John, for, for joining uh, this afternoon for your expert views and your insights. Uh, and a big thank you from me and a big thank you to uh, OECD and our host Israel uh, for, for, for giving us the, the platform this afternoon. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks.